Welcome. Welcome to this last keynote session of this conference. The organizers gave me, I believe, the most difficult task of the conference, that of introducing an already well-known, insightful, and creative person whose work is amazing. For the few of you who do not know him, Professor Mishra has spent quite some time at the Michigan State University, where he was, amongst others, the director of the master's program in educational technology. Since August 2016, Professor Mishra is at the Arizona State University, where he is currently the Associate Dean of Scholarship and Innovation and Professor in the Division of Educational Leadership and innovation. I take pride that we had at some point shared an alma mater, the Indian Institute of Technology. Professor Mishra is internationally recognized for his work on technology integration in teaching, the role of creativity and aesthetics in learning, and the application of design based approaches to educational innovation. With over a hundred articles and three books, he is an engaging public speaker, as well as an accomplished visual artist and a poet. So ladies and gentlemen, what poetry is Professor Mishra reciting to us today? COVID-19 brought massive disruption to the education sector and forcefully showed the importance of integrating technology in teaching and learning. However, did educators understand the paradigm shift needed? Did educators take advantage of the immense possibilities of technology in education? Did educators change the teaching style and andragogy to adapt to the new mode of teaching and learning? These are, I believe, pertinent questions which should be of prime concern to all education professionals. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Mishra's topic of this afternoon deals exactly with these pointed interrogation. I am sure we will all enjoy his keynote address. Please now welcome Professor Punya Mishra for his keynote address on the topic of contextualizing TPAC within the design of systems and culture. Over to you, Professor. Thank you, Dr. Bhujan. Uh, <clears throat> And I'm glad that we, we share an alma mater at some point. Um, and let me just uh, share my slides and let's make sure that works. Can you see my slides? Perfect. Um, so just wanna again, uh, thank all of you for inviting me for this keynote. Uh, you know, COVID has disrupted a lot of things and one of them is the pleasures that one gets from traveling. Um, my last big travel was actually back in October 2019 when I was in South Africa. Had a wonderful time there, um, giving, you know, meeting, uh, giving a keynote, meeting and making new friends, um, and some wonderful time just traveling around. And that was uh, very meaningful to me personally um, to go to. You know the land where Mahatma Gandhi started his nonviolence. Um, you know, and and just to see and you know just the wonderful landscape. And so I'm very disappointed that I'm here, sitting in my home office doing this. Um, so you know, I mean, th this is, is meaningful to all of us in so many ways. When I think about the three different countries, nations being represented here: India, my land of origin; South Africa, where all of you are; and USA, where I'm living today. And if I think about the legacy across these three amazing uh, humans, 
um, that connects us together. And so I'm very, very, very excited and happy to be here, though honestly disappointed that I'm not there in person. Uh, and there is, of course, one more thing that connects me to South Africa very deeply, and that is cricket. I have been a huge fan uh, of some of uh, your players, uh, Dale Stain, A.B. de Villiers, Hashim Amla, are like people I have really appreciated watching and enjoying their, their game. I really felt that South Africa got cheated out of a semifinal berth at the T20 World Cup this year because of some stupid point system. I felt that South Africa was doing really well and I was looking forward to seeing them even though India had got knocked out early. Um, but anyway, a um, little bit about myself. Um, you know, as, as uh, Dr. Bhujan said, I am Associate Dean for Scholarship and Innovation at the Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College at Arizona State University, and that is my contact information. A little bit about my background. Uh, my undergraduate degree is in engineering, after which, you know, um, I really did not see myself as an engineer, was interested in too many things, so ended up wanting to make educational film. And through that work, my way into education and the past three decades, can't believe that, um, have been in the space of educational technology, creativity, teacher education. And now I really see myself more as an educational systems designer um, than necessarily a researcher. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And again, I've also experienced the, the school system from a variety of different perspectives, both as a parent, uh, as well as a member of the school board, as you may know or may not know, uh, school boards in the United States are locally elected. And I was a member of the school board when I was in Michigan. Um, just to set the stage a little bit, I mean, if we go back to the February 2020, when we were first hearing about COVID-19, and back then, just there was a couple of countries uh, which were either partially or completely closed down, uh, schools had partially or completely closed down. And within two months, this is what it looked like, where uh, schools across the globe shut down. So in two months, 194 countries, uh, 1.6 billion learners. Um, had moved into brick and mortar schools into what we would call remote learning in whatever shape and form it took because I think it varied greatly in across the world. And all of a sudden we were in this unprecedented global educational social experiment that actually continues even today, uh, if you think about it. And back in March, I received an email from my friend Yang Zhao and he said like, and I did not believe it when he first said that, when he said, what if the coronavirus forces schools to close for more than a year? Um, but it started a conversation with a few of my colleagues and we started this uh, a webinar series that happens every Saturday. And those of you who are interested in these conversations, I really uh, urge you to go to silverliningforlearning.org um, where every week we meet with educators uh, educational innovators, teachers from across the world. Uh, we already have had 80 plus episodes, 100 plus guests um, from across the world engaging in this conversation that we call, you know, sort of conversations on the future of learning. Um, and one of the things that it has done uh, for me personally speaking is has given me an opportunity to look at how different systems across the world responded to COVID. And to be honest, there is a sense of disappointment and I see most of the responses that I hear about, right? Um, so we've had things like, you know, in, in Mexico, they tried to use TV and YouTube, uh, mostly in the United States, we have gone online and hybrid. Um, and, but the, the point is that in each case, people have tried to duplicate the classroom. I remember talking with a journalist in Israel who was talking about that kids were like frustrated, uh, parents were frustrated because they were being meant, made to go through Zoom classroom like 50 minute periods all through the day. And if you think about what school, what kids think of school, it's a chance to go to socialize, it's a chance to go to meet your friends. Learning for children is, you know, sitting in the chair and, and listening to a lecture is, I think, pretty low in their priority. So what we did, we took out all the best aspects of school, the community, uh, you know, the, the opportunities to, to grow and develop socially, emotionally, and so on. And we kept sort of what is so the, the ultimate nightmare of school of being stuck in front of a screen. Now, I fully understand that there are challenges. I think COVID, if it revealed one thing to us, is that there are significant chasms in terms of equity and access. Um, you know, we have always known this as educators that the privileged 
um, you know, whether financially or socially with social capital or otherwise, always get the bigger slice of the cake. But COVID-19 really brought that to the forefront. Um, and I know I have talked with uh, colleagues and friends in South Africa, and I know that the, the disparities there got even, you know, the, the disparities, already existing disparities got heightened in terms of access to education and learning to the most impoverished and needy of schools and children. And there was this emphasis on sort of this idea that it would be emergency remote, remote learning. And one thing that we have come to realize is that this COVID crisis, this pandemic is not going away in the sense that the one fine day, it'll just shut off and we will be back to normal. And I think that the urge to, to just reach the bare minimum standards <clears throat> of one would, what one would expect education could be cannot be the bar that we set for ourselves as educators. And what was sort of troubling at another level was that we ignored a lot of what we have learned so far. Uh, we actually have a, a record of research and scholarship and expertise and knowledge built around how one can teach using technology in, in powerful transformative ways. Um, but we sort of kept to sort of what is the bare minimum that we could do. Uh, my own work over the past decade has focused on this, uh, the framework called the TPAC framework, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the TPAC framework, which looks at how technology, pedagogy, and content can work together in particular contexts. So thinking about how whatever that we have to teach the tools and technologies that we have in hand and the pedagogical approaches that we can use can be well integrated together. That does not mean that we use everything for a lecture. That does not mean that, you know, we just use standardized tests and quizzes, but really think hard about how these pieces can work together. So the work that has been done there has been called sort of, you know, it's like the total package. So that's another easy way of remembering TPAC as being the total package. And the important thing to understand here is that TPAC is not necessarily about the most latest or the best digital technology that whatever we do as educators, you know, it lies at the intersection of these three things, whether you're using paper and pencil, that's a technology as well, or you're using mobile technology. Uh, for instance, um, you know, one of the big things that I see in developing countries is very innovative uses of WhatsApp, uh, because that is uh, something that is accessible and available to many people. Right. Um, so it is then, but thinking about what is possible with WhatsApp. Um, what, you know, I just recently spoke with uh, a young person who leads a group in India who does arts based education. And once COVID started, they couldn't do that anymore. And so they moved all of their work onto WhatsApp. And it's amazing what creativity they have brought uh, in into bringing the arts, whether it is, uh, you know, um, literature or it's poetry. Um, or it's the visual arts into the lives of children, even at a time when they were displaced from school. So the TPAC framework has been with us for a while. Um, you know, this, you know, the, the, the paper that uh, Matt Kaler, my colleague and I wrote back in 2006 has been cited a lot. Uh, there are a couple of handbooks um, that have come about. And the research in this field, when I said that there is a lot of research, there's a lot that we know already, the growth has been staggering. Uh, when I look at back in 2000 and 2007 and eight, um, you know, we had 18 articles and, you know, so on. And now it's more than 1200 of these. And I'm sure it's more because this was last tabulated, I think in spring of last year. Um, and with 404 dissertations that have been written about it. But more important for me has been its impact on practice. I think that if I look across the globe, the TPAC framework has been used in a variety of frameworks uh, I'm really proud of the way, for instance, <clears throat> over 40 colleges and universities of teacher education in Australia, almost the entire uh, range of colleges in, 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 in Australia, uh, they're teaching teachers for the future project, use the TPAC framework as a way of rethinking um, how teacher education curriculum should be. So one of the questions that I wonder about is like, why is it, the impact not as much as we would have liked to see given the amount of knowledge about this that we have, right? Now, this is not true that this was that COVID-19 in particular, you know, it came as a shock to the system. So I understand people in the first pass sort of reacted, you know, almost like, okay, let's just do what the bare minimum. But I think that we have to understand that we have to do more. And as a part of the silver lining for learning, 
I have had an opportunity to speak with groups and teams and school uh, or districts and organizations which did things differently. And I hope to come back to them and explain what I felt these groups did differently. Why were they better in responding to this pandemic than other organizations were? Our two examples, um, one that I'm really proud of personally because the Spark School that is on there was a school that my team uh, was involved in in helping design. And their response to the pandemic was very different than even the rest of the school district within which they were embedded. Uh, and the other example is this urban discovery schools in San Diego, who again uh, did a phenomenal job of responding. And so that makes me wonder as to why are certain organizations or certain groups more nimble, more able to meet the needs of their diverse group of learners. And I think what stands out for both those examples and the others that I have seen is that is a deep sort of care and concern for every learner, not just the ones who have access, not just, you know, so on. And this brings me to what I call the critical role that design plays in education, the way we think about education. And if we think about it, every aspect of education is designed. There is nothing sacred or set in stone about the way we have structured the educational system. It is all made up by us. And I think that's a really important thing for us to understand and acknowledge that, you know, that the, the school day should be broken up into periods, that we kids move from one group to the other, that we have tests, that we give you a piece of paper at the end and give you a funny hat and say, you are now graduated, that there are certifications. And all of those things have been made up by us. And I think that is really important to understand because what that means that if if we as humans made this system up, then we as humans can change it for the better. So as we dig into this idea of design, you know, one of the things, this is one of the definitions of design that I really like is by Perkins, who says it is a structure adapted to a purpose. So let's think about that for a second, because we live in this world which is incredibly artificial. I think the clothes that we wear, the languages we speak, um, the cars we drive, the you know, the way we live, eat, these are all made up by us. I mean, even the food that we eat, we think it's a natural kind, but we don't realize that like the corn, for instance, uh, that I have here is something that has been artificially selected and is very different from the corn that was originally found in the Americas when, you know, the settlers first came here, right? When Europeans first came here. And so this is the world that we live in is a designed world. And, and Herbert Simon said, the proper study of mankind is the science of design. And this design framework is something that I feel very strongly about and I bring into the work that I do. And what it tells me is that the educational system is producing results that it was designed to produce. Now the design might have been intentional, the design might be historical legacy, but it was designed to be that way. And so if students do not enjoy school, it's because we have designed it that way. We have not foregrounded the students' natural instincts for learning and play and engaging with the world. We have in fact made it something very sterile and different than what, it, what is truly engaging with them. If students are not creative, it is because we designed the system that way. And if we have serious issues of equity and access, that certain groups of people are fundamentally disadvantaged in access to knowledge and information and education, it is because it is designed that way. And this is where the work that I've been doing more recently, I think allows us to get some insight. Uh, and that this work we call the five spaces for design and education. It is an attempt to understand the role that design plays across the educational spectrum. This builds on work by design theorists like Richard Buchanan and Tony Goldsby Smith. Um, they were looking at design from the perspective of history. So they looked at how the field of design evolved from graphic design to interaction, uh, in, industrial design to in, instruct interaction design and systems design. So we take a slightly different tack because we are interested primarily in education while these scholars were interested in broadly the idea of design. And the way I'm going to introduce the five spaces of design and education is uh, walk you through sort of very briefly a story of my life because I feel like that's been how I have sort of engaged with this idea of design. So I was born in in this little, um, I mean, nothing in India is little, uh, you, know, <laughs> but, you know, town uh, in India called Katak. But as I was growing up, I was very interested in everything. I would read voraciously. 
Uh, even today, if I have nothing to read, I will read the back of the toothpaste. So I came in with sort of a really, I'm really interested in science and art and literature and math. And so I went in for, and in India, if you're good in science and math, you either end up being an engineer or a, or a, a doctor. So I ended up in, in Bits Pilani uh, for my undergraduate in electrical engineering. And those were, I have often talked about as the four black hole years of my life. Um, you know, where you took a young man who was deeply passionate and committed to learning and he just beat the system just beat that out of me. And in many ways, um, I was recently asked to write a chapter for a book called My Favorite Failure. And I talked about those four years and nobody likes failure. Um, what it did though is allowed me to understand what it means to be a committed, passionate learner, but that the system doesn't care. And I think it made me a better educator in the long run because it made me realize that. That said, at the end of those four years, I did not want to do engineering, but I was really interested in all of those things, art and literature and science and math. So I said, okay, I'm going to make educational film. And I ended up uh, getting my degree from IIT, um, you know, where we hopefully overlapped or at least uh, passed by uh, Dr. Bhujan um, at the Industrial Design Center in Visual Communications. Um, and that was transformational uh, for me to see this design perspective, to look and where all these different things I was interested in sort of came together. And I first started working on computers in a serious way with the Mac and so on, and realized that there was something interesting happening here in terms of the technology. This was very early on, you know, if you remember those old Macs with floppy disks and all of that, um, no, of course, no internet. But I had the sense that there is something interesting happening here that I need to study more. And I ended up getting my PhD in education uh, from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. It was when I was there that I found this book called Discovering. And in this book, uh, Dr. Ruth Bernstein talks about the fact that there are 400 different representations of the periodic table of elements. And we've all seen the periodic table of elements. It looks something like this. And, you know, with my interest in science and history of science, I knew about how Mendeleev had de developed it and all of that stuff and how it's, it's a really powerful way of organizing all the elements in the universe. But I was amazed to learn that there are all these different kinds of representation that chemists had been creating them over and over new three-dimensional versions, spiral versions, and what have you. And none of these are wrong. They are different ways of representing what is a complex set of relationships. It's sort of like when you look at the map of the world, you can have a Mercator projection, which gets certain things right, but gets other things wrong. And then you can have different kinds of projections of the earth. And so this gave me two key insights. The first was that what amazing creativity that was being denied to our students. The chemists were having fun. They were seeing chemistry as a bunch of Lego blocks that they can make and build wonderful structures with. While to our students, we were saying, here is one thing, this is the truth. And removing that element of play and creativity from learning. And that there was this interesting connection between technology, representation and content as well. So if you think about it, <clears throat> this representation, actually is incorrect fundamentally, it really needs to look like this. And the reason it looks like this and not this, where this long set of elements in the middle are actually put outside is a constraint of the technology of print because we want to pack so much information into these periodic tables that it becomes too long to fit into a regular page and the cells become too small. And so that led me to think that, oh, now we have a device, a technology, which is digital technology, that is not constrained by these things of print because I can zoom in, I can zoom out, I can scroll left, right, up, down, and maybe this will allow us to think about the periodic table in a new and different way. And so that became my dissertation, which was a piece of software called FLIPS, called Flexible Learning in the Periodic System. And this software doesn't work anymore because none of those plugins and all this is back and I'm talking, I developed this in uh, 97, 98. So you can imagine, you know, Gopher had just sort of was still around and the web was very, very new, very, very new. Um, so, but the software allowed people, students to traverse these different representations, compare and contrast across them and think of the periodic table as a system, not as the static thing. 
So this brings me to the first aspect of how design works in education. So the role of design in education is the creation of artifacts. So when I talk about an educational artifact, it could be anything what we call relatively stable objects that can be perceived through the senses. So it could be an app, a chair is an educational artifact. If the chair is bolted to the floor, it's, it constrains in ways the kind of engagement interaction students can do. Uh, one of my friends has this wonderful blog post called the teacher's desk. And he talks about how, where the teacher's desk is placed sends a message about power in the classroom. If the teacher's desk in the front, it says something, if that desk is put to a corner, it is now seen as a shared workspace. And suddenly the relationship between the teacher and the student changes just by how we align that artifact, right? So I want everybody to just, if one thing to take away from here is that in, when it comes to design, the first space that we can think about are the design of artifacts. So moving on with my life, I ended up after my PhD, uh, going to Michigan State University. A lot of my work was bringing this perspective on design into uh, technology and learning. So a lot of writing and working with teachers around that. Um, and this work has continued, a strand of this work has continued. Those of you are interested in this line of work, uh, there's a very recent publication with uh, my doctoral student, Melissa War, uh, which looks at this idea of teachers as designers and tries to unpack it in terms of what are the different ways in which teachers play out, you know, the role of design plays out in teaching, whether it is curriculum design or, you know, learning by design or, you know, so on, and also maps at how it plays out across the lifespan of, uh, across time in different ways. So this is just, but again, uh, this is an article which is on my website. If you're interested, you can find it. But what this tells us is that it is not just the artifacts that what educators do, and this is where the TPAC framework comes in uh, and gives us now the second space within which design works, which we call processes, right? So we, uh, uh, a process is a procedure or direction that can be used outside of the context in which it was created, right? And so we have lots of processes. So when you look at the TPAC framework, you're looking at bringing together technology, pedagogy, and content. It is the artifacts working in a process in a certain classroom context. I did a lot of work, you know, so, so now we have two spaces of design that I've talked about are artifacts and processes. And as in my work, and as Dr. Bhujan mentioned, you know, I do a lot of work around creativity and aesthetics and learning. And what that does is brings this idea of teaching and learning is more than the artifacts and the processes. It is really about designing an experience for our learners. And that brings us to the third space. And so as John Dewey said that all genuine education comes through experience does not mean that all experiences are genuinely or equally educative. And so as educators, our role is not just to work with artifacts, not just to develop processes, but actually to design experiences for our learners. So these are some examples of the work that I did with teachers in the Chicago public schools where, you know, these were STEM educators and how do we create an environment where they can feel free to play with STEM ideas, science and technology, and then bring this to their classroom to create powerful learning experiences. And now if we contrast that to some of the things that happened during the pandemic, I don't know how many of you um, know about things like this proctoring software, which are software which monitor every move that a student makes in an online space when they're taking an exam. Now think about what message this is selling to the students. It is saying, we don't trust you. We think that you're cheaters. It starts with that as an assumption. What can be more demotivating than that? Like if in your job at every step of the way, somebody was peering over your shoulder and saying, oh, why are you spending three minutes, you know, doing this on your phone? How would you feel? And so as an experience for the learner, we have demolished, destroyed any semblance of engagement, you know, connection, care, if I had to put it that way. Right. And so the design of the experience is something that I think is the third space within that. So when we talk about experiences, we talk about peace of time, it associated with sights, sounds, feelings, emotions, and thoughts. And good educators are always thinking about the kind of experience that they're creating. So at, I was at Michigan State, like uh, I said, for around 18 years or so, and then uh, came to Arizona State University which in some ways is very recognized for being an incredibly innovative place. I mean, we are so proud of it. We put it on every bus and banner that we can find that we are number one in innovation. So I have to say that, right? Um, and what, the, 
moving here in a different role as associate dean doing this work where i do now with school districts and such made me realize that that artifacts processes and experiences are not enough that when we think about design and education we have to think about systems and culture and it's important to recognize that technology whatever these tools are they are they are not they do not have meaning in and of themselves that they are embedded in a broader social practice i'm sure uh, people in, because i know this is in india but i know people in south africa are familiar with this idea of the missed call where you know you give a call to somebody and let it ring and you hang up and that way they know you have given them like you know if your kids are going somewhere you say okay give me a missed call when you have reached your friend's house you know the funny thing is in bangladesh at 1.70% of cellular traffic was missed calls and what's the reason for that and the reason for that is because if you are in a developing economy making a phone call costs money so you don't want to spend money now that doesn't make sense in a western context where calls are pretty much you are paying a fixed amount and all calls are free or whatever it means right and so understanding the meaning of a cell phone and its technology is more than understanding the technology it requires understanding the system and the culture within which it is embedded and so that brings me to the two last pieces of this five spaces of design its artifacts processes experiences systems and culture and systems are organized in purposeful structures of interrelated and interdependent elements and culture is a pattern of shared basic assumptions that we have and so as a designer as somebody who is in education you have to think about all of these it doesn't mean that you are you know that if you are a teacher the chances are you'll be working at the level of artifacts processes and experiences but you need to understand the broader systems and culture within which you are operating and so if change has to happen it has to become part of the broader system and culture i think that's a really important thing to understand i'll give an example of how things can get constrained because of not understanding these broader systems so i was working with um uh, my team was working with a school district to design a school for what we call a school for the future and the design team had administrators teachers parents architects community members business leaders and then at one point an idea came that how could we, how, could we expand school and learning into the community and the world so the idea was hey maybe students can come into the school the physical building just two times a week and three times a week they go out into the community they actually spend time in local businesses in local community centers in senior citizen centers and they come back for two days and everybody loved that idea because it really made school as a, as the center of the community except that what we didn't know at that time initially was that there are state laws about how much seat time students are supposed to have and that this would go against the laws of seat time now these laws have been around in the books for god knows how long most probably created for very valid reasons but they don't necessarily make sense now but that was not a fight we could fight we couldn't go and change the state law and so we had to scrap this idea and go back to the drawing board so this is an example of that this design that we were trying to create worked within a broader system that we had to be sensitive to and so this work now has led to what we call these large scale co design projects where this is an example of one where we got 170 plus around 165 people in the same room asking this question of what can high school can and should be now what was interesting is that in this group this is a local school district which has very diverse population the minority parents and kids did not show up and so we were not getting all the voices that were important in understanding this question so we had to actually go to an evening class where hispanic parents come and do this session there and we got a very different perspective on what school can and should be from this group similarly the students who showed up at the last the first session were all the high achieving successful students and we said that's not right because school is for everybody where are these other students so we went and did another series of sessions with a broader spectrum of students and we got a very different perspective so one of the things that they talked about and these this is a high school so these kids are 16 17 18 years old in a year they can be asked to go and die and kill for their country by being in the army or the military 
And yet to go to the bathroom, they needed to get a hall pass. And they talked so much about this lack of respect and that more than any pedagogical change you can do, more than any technological change that you can do, unless you address this big issue, that they feel disrespected in a space that should be their own, none of your change is gonna make a difference. And so I think it is deeply understanding that it is about the system, it is about the culture that is gonna determine a lot of our successes and failures. And so though I have been working in the field of technology for a long time, I have become incredibly sensitive to this broader issues of systems and culture. I'll give an example of this school that I talked about that we had designed, that we had not designed, but we had helped work with the school district in creating. Once the COVID pandemic hit, the school district decided to go one way. And this school resisted that. This school said, no, 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 that doesn't work for our kids. We have a different relationship with our kids. And so when we look across these different, you know, when I took, look, talked about silver lining for learning and the conversations we have had, if I look across these different organizations and what stands out, which were the ones that were resilient in this time, they bring a design-based mindset where they're willing to try different things, knowing that some things might fail. They never lose the focus on the most disadvantaged in their group. The ones who have second language issues, the ones who might have social emotional issues, they focus on the ones who are being left behind, not on the ones who are at, you know, in the middle of the curve, so to speak. That they create systems which are resilient, that technology is built into the system. It is not something that is outside of the system. And as very importantly, they identify their core values. What do they as an organization, as a culture truly care about? So the design cultures which have these values at the heart of them ask every time they take a decision, does it stick, does it match with what we're saying? And you know, COVID-19 is not gonna be the last crisis that education faces. I mean, we live in an incredibly volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous world, which is hyper-connected and interdependent. And the question we have to ask ourselves as educators, wherever in the world we may be, how do we make sense of this? And how do we plan for this emerging yet unpredictable future? And like I said, it's not just COVID-19. If I look at the rapid pace of change, if I think about how much information we can, I can hold in the palm of my hand and how that has changed over the past 4,000 years. And this greatest educational innovation we have, which is the internet, which allows a kid in, in Johannesburg access to information the same as a kid sitting here in Phoenix, Arizona. That's a really powerful tool. But at the same time, we also know that we have Twitter hacks and bots and Facebook and Twitter can be weaponized. So there's are new challenges that are coming our way. I don't know if we are ready for deep fakes where you know, videos and other things are created which are completely fake but cannot be identified as being so. I mean, it has already been used in an election in India, so it's not very far away or that we live in a surveillance state where a question like should facial recognition technology be used in schools is not science fiction. I mean, these, these devices, I mean, my cell phone does facial recognition every time it logs me in. So it's not something that's very far away in the future. And then I gave this example of Proctorio of monitoring every move. And so I think it's really important as we think about technology that they are not neutral. Uh, there's a lot of evidence to show um, that the biases that we have, we program in, into our software. So when we look at big data, when we look at AI, which are all coming down the pike, that this trust in algorithms is, is very complicated and very could be potentially dangerous. So what does it mean when we pass on decision-making to the algorithms? And let's not think that this is some science fiction future I'm talking about. This is the present. It is just not uniformly distributed yet. And as we think about education, as we think about the, you know, the world we live in today, where the world's largest taxi company owns no vehicles, the most popular media provider creates no content, as Facebook, Alibaba and Amazon own no inventory and Netflix doesn't own a cinema house. And so what implications does it have for the jobs of the future? Right? And the, the, the biggest elephant in the room, which is global climate change. I mean, it has gonna have impact across the world in ways that we are completely unprepared for. 
And so the pandemic for me is just the first in many challenges that are going to be faced by education. I could go on and on, right? But what cannot be denied is the important role that education plays in creating our present and our future. And I would argue that there are many reasons for the global challenges we face. And a key among them has been a failure to imagine what education can be. And that I think we need to start thinking of building more resilient organizations, thinking of them as designers, not as just actors in this play, but actually as authors of this play. As we look at artifacts, processes, experiences, systems, and culture. And most importantly, combined with a discussion about our values and what we care about. We often in education don't have much space to talk about these kinds of things. And so I think it's important that we understand the system, we understand the culture, but really we see ourselves as designing the system and designing the culture. So one of a couple of my favorite quotes, this is from Farley in an article in Educational Researcher, where he says that the process of education is not a natural phenomenon of, excuse me, of the kind that has somewhat you know, it is not like we are not engaged in biology or physics where we are studying things that are out there. And he says that it is not in need of research to find out how it works. It is in need of creative invention to make it work better. And so I think that is our role as educators is to really be designers of these systems, of this culture, of these artifacts and processes and experiences, right? And the other quote that I really love is from Steve Jobs. He says, life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, everything around you was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And once you accept that fact, you realize that you can go and change that stuff, right? And once you learn that you'll never be the same again. Um, coming towards the end of uh, my talk, some of the work that we've been doing, you can find out a lot more about this by going to learningfutures.education.asu.edu. Um, we recently did this project called Project Springboard, where we worked with 22 school, schools or school districts spread out pretty much across the broader swath of the United States. And we had a few uh, schools from Australia and, and Canada participating in this as well, uh, where over a bunch of weeks, a group of vertical teams of educators worked on reimagining what school could be post COVID-19. Um, and I think that that was, that was a, we are in fact, just collecting some data on that right now about the impact of that, but that was a wonderful, wonderful project um, that we did. Um, we have a couple of podcasts that we do that any of you can subscribe to. So if you go to the value laden podcast, this is the one that I host. Um, in this one, I speak with, these are conversation with educational leaders from across the world. Um, ab around how they develop pers their personal ethical and moral compass and how that impacts the work that they do as educational leaders. Because this is something that this idea of values uh, is something that, and, 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 and the, the sort of deeper ethical aspect of education is something that I've started thinking a lot about. And I said, the best way to do it is to talk to smart people about it. And, and that ended up becoming a podcast. Um, the one that you might also be interested in is called the Learning Futures Podcast. Um, this is one where, like the title says, we focus on speaking with people who are doing incredibly innovative work in sort of the, the aspect of thinking about the future of learning. Um, and we have had some, this is on to its third season now, and it's, it's a wonderful podcast, and I really recommend that. You should be able to get it anywhere you get your podcast. As we look to this future, I think one of the things that it struck us that in fact the best, that we might not be the best people to be thinking about it, that maybe the best people to think about it are people who write speculative fiction. And so we started the series where we got science fiction writers um, to write uh, stories about the future of learning. We got academics to respond to those stories. And then we did a whole series of webinars on it. I'm happy to announce that the first story was actually based in Africa by an author who is actually originally Australian, but since his wife teaches in the international schools, was in Johannesburg and uh, wrote that story placed in Africa. And it's a wonderful story. And we just had some wonderful conversation and thinking around issues of education that I think authors of fiction can bring. Again, all of those are available at learningfutures.education.asu.edu. And I can drop those links in the chat 
once I'm out of this presentation. So coming full circle, this idea of design that is, is something that I think that we as educators need to embrace and to recognize that every one of us designs. As Herb Simon said, everyone designs or devises courses of action aimed at exist, changing existing situations into preferred ones. And that educators, we work across all five spaces. Now, our impact might be more on one or the other. If you're a software developer, you are working much more in the space of the artifacts and processes. But if you are not sensitive to the nature of student learning experience, if you're not sensitive to the broader system and culture within which your educational software will work, your software will not be successful. Now, if you are a school administrator or uh, a principal, you are working at the level of systems and culture. That is what you are designing. And artifacts and process and experience all play an important role, but unless you bring a systems view, a culture view, a values-based view, none of your work is gonna be successful. So this is sort of my current work, research work, and sort of locating it within sort of, you know, that understanding the role that technology can play pre-pandemic, in a pandemic, post-pandemic, requires us to understand that technology functions, that it, it's, its impact is gonna differ based on how we think about each of these five spaces. I mean, one of the good examples, you know, that I give, examples that I give is, Students or kids spend literally hundreds of hours playing video games, right? And so a lot of people have talked about, oh, how can we bring that energy that they bring to playing video games into, you know, can we make educational video games? If you go look at most educational video games that are used in a classroom context, they have to be, they are designed so that they can be played within 35 to 50 minutes. And why is that? Is because we have broken our curriculum and our school day into chunks of 45, 50 minutes. So any game that is designed has to fit that constraint, which in some way goes, goes, goes fundamentally against the ethos of a video game, which is like this immersive thing that you play for a long time. And so that's where the constraint of a school and the way we have designed school gets in the way of using an educational technology. So um, coming to the end, I, this is two photographs that I want to share with you, which are like badly photoshopped. These are my two kids um, on their first day of school and their last day of school. And I just photoshopped them together. And what is interesting to me is how sad the little ones look because they see that for the next 12 or 13 years of their life, they're going to be stuck in this and they're sort of what is going on and how excited they are when they're like, okay, now I'm done with this. I can, you know, go to college where I will hopefully have a little bit more freedom to learn and explore and grow. And I think that, that I keep this with me because it's a reminder of the work that we do and how important it is and how personal it is at some level. And um, I do hope that, that in, each, in some ways, each of us leaves it better uh, than we find it. So with that, I think I'm at 44 minutes. I'd said 40, 45 minutes or so. So I um, want to thank you all. That is my contact information. I do reply to every email I get, though it might take me a while sometimes, uh, but I do reply to every email. A lot of my work, almost all of the work that I do is on my website. So I've, that would be the first place to go to if you're looking for any publications that I have, anything that I mentioned here. Um, and, uh, that's that. So again, thank you so much, uh, for inviting me. I hope next year, uh, we could do this face to face. Uh, and I also wish all of you, uh, the best of health and, and, and safety to you and your loved ones and what are clearly, uh, very difficult times for all of us. And uh, with that, thank you very much. <laughs>